Hi everybody, let's talk about the interference of two sinusoidal traveling waves that are moving in opposite directions. So we have one sinusoidal traveling wave going to the right and one going to the left. And the question is if they're moving in the same medium at the same time, one to the right, one to the left, what's going to happen? How is the medium going to behave when this is the situation? So we're going to start with the assumption that the two waves are identical that they have the same wavelength, that they have the same frequency, and that they have the same amplitude. The only difference between them is going to be the direction of propagation of the wave. Since uh, um, we discussed this in a previous video, the sinusoidal traveling waves can be described by the mathematical function A sine of kx, remember that k is the wave number, 2 pi over lambda, minus omega t. Omega is called the angular frequency and it is equal to 2 pi radians multiplied by the frequency. And this is the description for a wave that travels to the right, a sinusoidal wave traveling to the right. The mathematical description for a sinusoidal wave traveling to the left is with a plus sign. It's kx plus omega t as the argument of the sine function. So as we said, the amplitude is the same. So we're using the same a for both of these waves. The wavelength is the same, so we're using the same k for both of these waves, and the frequency is the same, so omega is going to be the same. The superposition principle, and this is the most important concept to understand from this chapter, is that when dealing with waves, the uh, superposition principle says that when two waves propagate in a medium, the displacement in a medium that wave number one would produce if it was alone and the displacement of that wave number two would produce in the medium if it was traveling alone, when they, when they travel together in the same medium, the displacement is simply the sum of the displacement one plus the sum of the displacement two. Pretty much the same situation, for example, if you apply force F1 to an object and the object moves in that direction, if you apply force in a different direction to the object, uh, if you apply a force to an object in a different direction, applying the force F2, then the direction in which the object is going to move is given by the resulting force, which is the sum of the two uh, forces. So for waves, something similar like that, uh, to that happens. It's called the superposition principle. So we saw that in a previous video where we sent two pulses moving in opposite directions, one going to the right, one going to the left. When the pulses start to overlap, then the displacement that one of the pulses would tell the medium to have, we call it D1, and the displacement at the same location that the second pulse would tell the medium to have would be D2, but when the pulses, or since the pulses are overlapping here, the actual displacement that the medium will get is the sum of D1 plus D2. So if we repeat this operation of at every given point, looking at the displacement produced by one uh, pulse, and adding the displacement produced by the other poles, then what you get is the actual shape of the medium when these two pulses are overlapping. The shape does not have two bumps, it only has, in this case, one bump because the two pulses are already overlapping and the resulting displacement is the sum of the displacement D1 plus D2. So, since we have an equation for D1, an expression for D1, and we have an expression for D2, we can plug them in in this equation and see and play with this a little bit, see what we get. So the tool that we're going to use here is the trigonometric identity for the sum, the sine of the sum of two angles. So the sine of alpha plus or minus beta is the sine of alpha cosine beta plus or minus cosine alpha sine beta. So if we call alpha kx and call beta omega t, then we can split each term into two. The first one becomes a sine kx cosine omega t minus a cosine kx sine omega t. And the second term that we have, this one right here, can we split into two pieces, a sine of kx cosine omega t plus a cosine kx sine omega t. So you can see here that we have one term that is going to cancel because it's identical, but has a minus and then the other ones are plus. So that goes away and the first and the third are identical but they're plus so they add together and the final answer is 2a sine kx cosine omega t 
So this is what the math says is going to happen when we add these two waves moving in opposite directions. So what does this look like? So again, D1 is a traveling wave, sinusoidal traveling wave to the right. D2 is a sinusoidal traveling wave moving to the left. And we found that when we combine these two waves together, we get 2a sine kx cosine omega t. So what is the graph of this look like? So at any, let's say that at t equals zero, just to, for reference here, choosing one point t equals zero, the cosine of zero is one. So the function that we're looking at is the function 2a sine of kx. So that's a sine function. It, it behaves like the other two waves except that it has, at this moment, it has a bigger amplitude, an amplitude of 2a. Now is this, as time goes on, is this move, is this wave going to move to the right or moving to the left? Well, let's take a look at this. We can group 2a and the cosine of omega t and call that the ampli an amplitude as a function of time. Notice that this is the number that is multiplying the sine of kx function. So at whatever time t you choose, whenever you take a picture of this wave, a of t will have some value and the uh, shape of the string will be the shape dictated by sine of kx. So what this is telling us is that uh, the uh, wave that we get in the resulting wave, the summation of d1 and d2 is a wave that is like a sine wave with the difference that the amplitude changes with time. It oscillates as a function of x. The wave has a maximum amplitude of a of t. So it goes between a of t and minus a of t. So if at some point the wave has an amplitude of a of t, sometime later it might have a smaller amplitude, but the shape hasn't changed. It's still a sine kx function, just with a smaller amplitude. So also notice that sometimes the function a of t, because cosine of omega t can be zero sometimes, when omega t is pi over two, three pi over two, etc. then what happens is that we have a wave that has, at that moment, has no amplitude, it's perfectly flat. a of t is zero, so the resulting wave is completely flat at this time. So the, uh, what we can conclude from this is that the um, resulting wave here of D1 and D2 combined doesn't actually move. It doesn't go to the right, it doesn't go to the left. It simply oscillates in place. The amplitude gets big and gets small, zero, and then it gets big again, and so on. And this beast that we have created with the two traveling waves in opposite directions is called a standing wave because it doesn't go anywhere. It's a wave, but it stands in place. It oscillates in place. Notice that the standing wave has the same wavelength as the parent waves. The daughter wave, the combination of the two parents, has the same wavelength as the parents because the k numbers here are all the same. We start with the assumption that the parent waves have the same wavelength and the math tells us that the daughter wave has the same k, that is the same wavelength. All right, let me actually show you what the standing wave looks like. We already said that uh, it's going to be a, a sinusoidal wave that with an amplitude that is going to be changing with time. So let me show you well in this chapter under simulations. You can see what does it look like. So we have a wave traveling to the right, a wave traveling to the left, and what the actual medium is going to be doing as these waves travel through it is these two are going to create a standing wave. Notice how the shape doesn't change, only the amplitude. The wave gets stretched in the vertical direction. Now let's talk about the points, special points in this wave, which are, you just kind of understand that, the points, so when you see as you saw in the, in the simulation, the wave kind of oscillates between this maximum position uh, here of 2a and minus 2a. So what you find in a textbook depiction of a standing wave is uh, what you see at the bottom of the screen there, these kind of blobs together, connected together. 
because they're just showing you two of the positions or the shapes that the standing wave is going to have as a function of time. At t equals zero, the standing wave is going to look like this. Half a period later, the standing wave is going to be looking like that. And at any other time, the standing wave is going to be between these two uh, positions or between these two shapes. So in books, they only show you those two. And uh, notice that these points, these are points that are uh, special because the displacement of the medium at those points is zero. Those points are called nodes. And they happen on the x-axis at the points where the sine of kx is equal to zero. Sine of kx is zero at multiple points, right? When kx is equal to zero, that is x equals zero, you get one of the points, that's the first one. There's another point when kx is equal to pi, so at on the x-axis at x equal pi over k, you get another zero, etc. Two pi, three pi, etc. So there's multiple places where the standing wave does not oscillate, where the function sine of kx is zero, regardless of regardless of what the cosine omega t is doing, simply because the sine of kx is exactly zero at all times at that location. So those points never move; they're called nodes. The um, in between those points. In between the nodes, you find these points that oscillate a lot. The medium there goes from, let's say, this top position to this bottom position and back up and then down and so forth. And uh, therefore, these points oscillate the most in this medium when the standing wave is present. So we put an X at those points on the X axis where the oscillation of the wave is the maximum. And we're going to call those points anti nodes, the opposite of the node. The nodes don't move, the antinodes have maximum vibration. Notice that the distance between two antinodes is lambda divided by two because the wavelength of the standing wave is, as you can see there, and uh, the distance therefore between the antinodes is half of the wavelength. The distance between two nodes is also lambda divided by two. The distance between two nodes you can see there on the left should be also lambda divided by two so for a standing wave we know that adjacent nodes are separated by a distance of lambda over two adjacent anti nodes are also separated by a distance of lambda divided by two one more time notice the points on the x-axis where you have nodes where there is no oscillation at the bottom uh, where the standing wave is depicted as a function of time, notice that x equals 0 does not move. Also 2.5, x equals 2.5 doesn't move. There's another node at 5, another node at 7.5, another one at 10, etc. Those are the nodes. The anti-nodes are right in between those, those values. All right, that's it for now. for now. I'll see you in the next video.